Heavenly Father, I humbly beseech you to see before you a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, and a sinner of your own redeeming. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. One of the things that I love about our Episcopal worship is the amount of scripture that we are able to read during our time to have a piece from the Old Testament, a piece from the New Testament, uh, one of the letters in the Gospel. And I, I love hearing all of those. Sometimes, however, though, that means that we cut a story in half, right? And so uh, today I want to point out that uh, it's very difficult to understand all that's happening in the Gospel lesson with Jesus and the demoniac if you don't actually have the whole story put together. And so let me just begin with the first part, okay? So just follow along, because we haven't read this. If you wanted to open up the Bible to Luke, you could. Uh, right there, chapter 8, verse 22. Now, the passage begins with the crowds pressing in on Jesus, right? So he's teaching on the edge of the beach, right there on the other side of the lake from where Gerasene is. He's preaching, he's teaching. Uh, the crowds come and press in on him. They want healings and acts of power. He gets into the boat and they set off, after he preaches a little more, they set off into the sea. At which point, silly Jesus falls asleep. Okay, so he's exhausted. He falls asleep in the boat. And a storm comes up and begins to turn the boat this way and that way. And uh, his followers panic. Uh, and they wake him up. And he stills the storm. Some of you probably know this passage. He stills the storm. It's called the stilling of the storm. And so all the winds go away and all the waves calm down and they're able to go on. Now, the question arises, and this is the important part. The question arises among his followers, who is this that even the wind and waves obey? Right? So they want to know, who is this Jesus? Who is it that can still the storm? into the first part right so now we pick up with the gospel we just read and they arrive on the other side of the lake in a place called Gerasene Gerasene represents the wilderness it was in the wilderness or they considered it in the wilderness and you might think of it as that place where the people like that live over there right so if you were a first reader of the gospel you would have known this wasn't just the wilderness but he had, they had ended up in a foreign territory with people who aren't like the rest of the people in Jerusalem. And Jesus steps out of the boat. He's immediately confronted by a man, a demon. And this man has been, you need to understand, he didn't just kind of, hey, I have a demon. I'm going to go live naked in the tombs. That that's not what happened. What happened was the people were afraid of him and cast him out of the town, Gerasene, into the tombs like you know get as far away from us uh, as you can he's been completely renounced by the society around him and we find out almost immediately that the demons uh, are named legion now legion means a lot it actually references right uh, a roman legion but two meanings so we also need to be aware that the author is pulling at our understanding that this was an occupied time, that the Romans were there as well. And, and, and that's important because that way we begin to see that Jesus' power isn't just going to be storm and sea. It won't even just be demoniacs. It's actually a new kingdom coming that will threaten the Romans as well. So there is a, a metaphor as well as the narrative being played out here. Now, he cries out, son of the most high god the answer to the question from the boat right who is this that commands the waves and the sword? why it's the son of the most high god so you have to have both stories there if you understand what he's answering this answers the question now only the son of god can still a storm and only the son of god can make the winds obey 
And so Jesus heals this man by sending the demons into pigs uh, and into the deep, uh, which is not where they want to go, by the way, uh, in case you missed that. They don't want to go into the deep. They'd like to avoid the abyss because that's where sea monsters live. And demons evidently don't like sea monsters, and so they didn't want to go into the abyss where the sea monsters were. So, of course, Jesus sends them to the abyss where the sea monsters eat the pigs, evidently. Now, important to the story also is that the people began to fear Jesus. So, for us, as followers of Jesus, we often miss this point. The majority of the people who are right there with him get scared. Like, this is a very powerful person who has just freed this man and made him whole and sent all these demons away. And so they actually now cast out Jesus. I don't know if you, you, read, you heard that in the passage, but they're like, get out of here. These are very, these are very fearful people, evidently. And so they're like, Jesus, get out of here. Get out of here. But the man, the man goes as he's healed, returns to the community, and tells the good news of Jesus to the people who will listen. So we have two responses now to who the Son of the Most High God is. One out of fear, right? And one out of a sense of freedom that allows him to go and teach. So the themes, have faith in Jesus. Right? Don't worry about the storms around you. Jesus is the prophet, healer, and the mighty worker. We see it in both the storm and we see it with the demon. Jesus is the Son of God, the proclamation that's being made in the midst of the Scripture. We also see a Gentile mission taking shape, right? A mission to the other people, the religious different than ourselves. That Jesus is actually even going to go be with those other people and do his work there. So that mission to the Gentiles is taking shape. And last of all, we see discipleship, faithful action upon having received the grace of Jesus. The demoniac, freed from the demons, goes and tells the good news of Jesus and his mission. Now I want to quote here from Luke Timothy Johnson, a New Testament scholar. He says, God's visitation is for salvation. Now when we see two stories, we perceive not only that they both demonstrate the power of the prophet over winds and spirits, but that they join the elements of faith and salvation, and thereby provide a link between Luke's version of the parable of the sower, where hearing the word and going and doing it are linked. Moreover, this will be repeated so we're getting ready to enter a whole season of reading Luke's gospel. And you're going to hear this theme of faithful response to salvation over and over again. They act, Johnson suggests, as if believing they might be saved. You see, the work of the kingdom of God, the reign of God, is the work of salvation. We are healed not only for our sake, but we are healed for a greater purpose. Uh, a, a piece of work for the glory of God through ministry. We're invited to receive faith with, that God is with us even to the end. And that God invites us to make manifest His work in this world serving, healing, and doing good works. Not as if we're going to earn our salvation, but rather in response to our salvation. You are being called... To respond to the faith that you have in this place. You're being called today to go and be a part of making good and the kingdom of God in the rest of the world. Now, you and I have known, most of us have known each other for quite a long time, uh, not just during my uh, 20 years in the diocesan office or 15 years as bishop, but also because you all approved me to go to seminary so many years ago. So we've, we've, we've known each other for quite a long time. And we were remarking just this morning over coffee about how things have changed and how long ago that was. 
indeed. It even seems really long ago that we were in 2019, <laughs> and we find ourselves here today after having traveled a tough couple of years together. But I want to remind you that in that time, in these many, many years, people have found comfort in this place, healing, time of grief and burial, healing for the sick. Here you have found some spiritual food. Of all the many things you could do on Sunday, you happen to be here today, right? Because there's something good here, something worth being a part of. Here you have welcomed new people. You've baptized children. and Today we will confirm and welcome into the family of faith a new person. God is faithful here. And you are to have faith. God is with you to the very end of the ages. And like the man on the seashore, you're not to be afraid. You're to keep coming back to find the words and the goodness that you need to live the rest of your life out in the world. But this is also not meant for yourself. Just as you have harbored folks in this place, harbored yourselves and found a family of faith, so too you are to go out and do good works in your community. You are to share the good news, share the faith you have, care for others. There will be people in need of healing, people who have been cast out of their own communities, people who long to hear something good and faithful. I mean, come on, right? I mean, we are living in a tough time, right? Great divisions, right, of, all, of every kind. And Jesus just keeps coming. He comes to everybody. He comes to the religious, as he does in this story, to the non-religious. He comes to the faithful and the unfaithful alike and loves and heals. And so this is your work. Do not cast him out as soon as you walk out the door. Don't leave him here in the building, but take Jesus with you into the community. Find something good you can do for somebody else today and tomorrow. For this is the faithfulness and works that this passage is talking about. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.